What's going on, Graveyard Shift family? Y'all, we have a very, very interesting case that we're trying to get down to the bottom of today. And by the end of this shift, I need for you to let me know in the comment section who you think did it. Look, <laughs> y'all, do you not see the bags under my eyes? Yo, I have been up all night researching this case, trying to find out where little Mary Fagan is buried. And so I can just tell y'all what happened. <sighs> Calm down, Dalen. Y'all, okay. Mary Fagan. I know a lot of you may know who that name is, but I know there's a lot of y'all who ain't never heard that name a day in your life. But look, we're going to shed light on this story today. An inflammatory murder from Georgia's past has come back to life. It certainly has. The infamous tragedy of Mary Fagan and Leo Frank is revived as the Fulton County District Attorney begins to form what he calls a conviction integrity unit. Leo Frank was a New York Jewish factory superintendent convicted of killing a 13-year-old factory worker. Mary Fagan, his trial, outraged the nation with anger over race, gender, and religion. It boiled over when a doubting Georgia governor commuted his sentence and a mob kidnapped and lynched him. Now those doubts lingered throughout the century. And the sexual details alone reveal to CBS 46's Sally Sears how the passions of the past come back to life. It's hard to imagine anyone more passionate about the rape and strangulation of little Mary Fagan than her great niece, Mary Fagan Keene. Leo Frank was a sexual pervert and that he raped her and murdered her. The jury found Frank guilty in 1913. Neat files in her home today hold reminders that many women testified against Frank because of his inappropriate sexual behavior toward them. A lot of the women that testified against him with that, there were 20 women, a lot of them were former employees, and they left. Did they say why they left? Yes. Because? Because Leo Frank did immoral, appropriate, improper things to them. Today's crime scene investigator Cheryl McCollum wonders about that testimony. I think you can get one or two people to lie for you. I don't know that you're going to get 20 to come and tell the same thing over and over and over. She reminds us that's not rape or murder, but still the heat of that trial contains other embers still burning, like the notes found on Mary Fagan's body. The notes are bothersome for so many reasons. I found those notes and much more in the Georgia State Archives. In these files at the Georgia Archives, the lawyer for one of the star witnesses against Frank is convinced he made a horrible mistake. Horrible convicting an innocent man. His own client, star witness Jim Conley's language, is in those notes, the lawyer came to believe. And if Frank did not compose them, Jim Conley did, he thought, and he's the murderer undo the wrong that I have helped do. The language is all about sex. Play and lay and love were Conley's common words for sexual intercourse, even rape, the lawyer concluded. Those sensational doubts sent to the governor, who also doubted Frank's conviction, commuted his death sentence. That caused an angry mob to kidnap Frank from prison and lynch him. The archives smolder today with passion, the Conviction Integrity Unit could reignite. I'm Sally Sears, CBS 40. It was a little girl, y'all. She was born back in like 1899, right? She had two older brothers. She had an older sister. She had a mama. She had a daddy. Her father ends up passing away early in life, right? So her mother takes all the kids and move here to Atlanta, Georgia. She gets remarried, but you know, money ain't money ain't multiplying like it should. You feel me? So this is back in the early 1900s. So her and her new husband and the children, they all moved into a one bedroom apartment in like, you know, a poor neighborhood in Atlanta. Boom. See, this is the early 1900s. So you know, times was different back then. You know, now you can get a job at 15, 16. Back then, as long as you had hands and feet, <laughs> you can work. So around the age of 10, you know, Mary goes out and gets a job. You know, stepdad is like, look, man, I'm providing 
for four kids that are not mine. <laughs> so everybody got to chip in. All hands on deck. Mary. Mary goes and gets a job at the age of 10 years old. Y'all, she goes and gets a job at the National Pencil Company. You heard that right. She was in there making pencils, y'all. <laughs> While Mary should have been at school, Mary was making pencils. But Mary was a hard worker. Mary kept a job, you know, kept a job long that I ever kept one. <laughs> Mary worked her job for a couple years. But now, check this out. On Saturday, April 26, 1913, when Mary was 13 years old, she decides she's going to walk up to her job and get her check. Rightfully so. She's a hardworking woman at this point. She goes to get her check. Her check was $1.20. $1.20. I remember when I first started working, minimum wage was $5.50. Do you remember how much minimum wage was at your first job? Let me know in the comment section. But Mary goes to get her check on this Saturday day. There was a parade, right? There was a, the uh, what's it called? The Confederate Memorial Parade going on that day. So Mary trying to go get her ducats so she can duck off to the parade and do what kids, do what hard working kids do. And that's, I guess, chill at parades at back then. I, I don't know. But here's where it gets sticky. Mary goes to get her check at about noon. Hear me out. No one sees Mary after that. She's gone. Now, Mary had to get her check. This is where the names start coming into play, so you better pay attention. Mary went to get her check from a supervisor by the name of Leo Frank. Don't forget that name. Leo Frank. That's the supervisor. Nobody sees her after that. Nobody. So this is about noon, right? So about three in the morning, three in the morning, the night watchman, a guy by the name of Newt Lee, he just so happens to find Mary's body inside the basement. He calls the police, like immediately calls the police. But when they get there, they find her laying face down in like all this debris. So they roll her over and like her face is like battered and bruised and scratched. Y'all, they even said one of her eyes was knocked out. She's 13, y'all. Trying to get her check to go to the parade and kick it. And they even said that she looked as if she had been assaulted. If you know what I mean, y'all. But this is where it gets crazy. This is where it gets crazy. Underneath her body, there were two notes. Two handwritten notes. Oh, I'm going to read them for you. Ma'am, that Negro hire down here did this. I went to make water and he pushed me down the hole. A long, tall Negro. Black, that who it was. Long, slim, tall Negro. I write while play with me. Crazy, right? That's wild. Because if the black man, Newt Lee, who found the body, was the one that committed the murder, why would he blame the black man? <laughs> okay. If it was Leo, why were, why was the letters so ill written and sloppily with misspelled words? <laughs> Leo, mind you, is a graduate from Cornell. <laughs> like, it wouldn't be written like that. So that's why the letters are just iffy. Let's keep the story rolling, y'all. 
So boom, now all eyes are still on the night watchman who found her, Newt Lee. Because everybody's like, hey man, you found the body. And it's kind of like a he who smelt it dealt it. Like, bro, you found the body, you must have did it. So they're trying to call Leo, who, mind you, Leo's the manager. Leo not picking up the phone. <laughs> Leo's nowhere to be found. And now they like, where Leo at, man? Why everybody seem to be around here except for Leo? Mind you now, crowds are starting to try to show up around the scene. Like, it's getting wild. Boom. Leo, he's 29 years old, graduate of Cornell University. He's married, got a wife named Lucille. But see, Lucille was related to an established rabbi of the time. So people already felt like old Leo only really married Lucille so he could be, you know, looked at for a, a, as of a higher status within the Jewish community. That's just what they're saying about Leo. I don't know. <laughs> That's just what I heard. So they finally get in contact with Leo. They like, Leo, hey, bro, you need to come down here. There's an emergency at the job in which you manage. So Leo playing dumb. They was like, Leo, do you got an uh, 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 employee by the name of Mary Fagan? He was Mary Fagan. Mary, Mary, Mary. I mean, that name, ooh, it's a whole lot of Marys that work here. Uh, is it a F Fagan with a F or is it with a P? Leo, do you know Mary Fagan? Oh, I, I, yeah, 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 I know Mary. Well, Leo, when's the last time you seen Mary? Ah, oh, man. Man, what's today, man? Maybe maybe a couple days ago. Leo, Mary was supposed to come get her check from you today. Oh, you said Mary Fagan. You got to enunciate, brother. Yeah, she came earlier today and, and got her check. I ain't seen her since then, though. No. Is that right? Is that right, Leo? Yeah, I ain't seen her since she got her check. So at this point, they're putting Leo in the elevator to take him down the shaft to go to the basement where little Mary's body is. As they're getting off the elevator, everybody smells like the, the scent of, like, poo. Like poo. Like grown folks poo. Whatever. So they take Leo, and as they're getting closer to the body, Leo is just like freaking out. But then again, rightfully so, if you ain't never seen nothing like that, I mean, that could freak you out. Or if you did that to somebody and you're seeing your work, it could freak you out. So I don't think that's really a good indicator of if did he or did he or did he not do it. So boom. So after Leo freaks out, they bring him back in the elevator, take him back upstairs, and they bring him down to the police station. So they decide to they're going to let Leo see these notes that was left up under the baby's body. They're going to show him these handwritten notes. They at the police station, and they go to get the notes. Y'all, check this out. Only to find out that the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, the newspaper of Atlanta, had came down to the police station and taken the notes <laughs> because they wanted to run a news article on it. The police didn't stop them. Y'all, me and you have watched enough episodes of Law & Order, CSA, CSI, CSB, C, uh, 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 DDD, Miami, <laughs> to know that that's evidence. You can't remove evidence. <laughs> well, I guess back then you could remove evidence if the newspaper needed it for an article. Wild. So who knows what was lost, messed up, mixed up <laughs> just from that transaction. But after doing some investigating, they come to find out there was a spot located right where little Mary Fagan worked near her workstation. It was like a red spot. After doing some tests, they end up finding out that that spot was, in fact, blood. And records say that strands of hair, uh, which were similar to the color of young Mary's hair, were found in that area, too. So the police concluded that whatever happened, maybe the attack happened upstairs at her workstation. And then her body was then brought down to the basement of the pencil factory. And that's where it was left. So look, 
Now, all this going on, right? Mind you, this is just like in the day, day after, day after, after leading up. You know what I'm saying? We we are just two days after the <laughs> the the occurrence of Little Mary at this point. A woman comes up that works at the pencil factory. And she says that on the day that Saturday, she was at work and around noon, she did not see Leo Frank at his desk. Where were you, Leo? Where were you in that window? You were supposed to be sitting at your desk. Where were you at? Now the state got a witness, okay? They used that witness to go ahead and lock Leo up. They like, nah, it ain't. For some reason, Leo, it ain't sitting right with us. You did it. We locking you up. So they lock Leo up. But they don't stop looking at Newt. They don't stop looking at Newt. Newt, you found her. We ain't going to stop looking at you. Don't think just because Leo is arrested that you free and in the clear, right? So they still looking at Newt. But then this is where it gets crazy. There was this guy named Jim Connolly, another black guy. He was a janitor at the pencil factory. Now, Jim was caught rinsing out and trying to clean a, what looked like to be a bloody shirt inside the sink around the day that this incident happened. So once this information comes out, the police go to Jim, they get to asking questions. Oh, Jim can't handle the pressure, man. Jim confesses. Jim confesses. Jim the janitor confesses to writing the two notes that were found under Miss Little Mary Fagan. Y'all, but here's the kicker. He says that he stumbled upon Leo killing Mary and Leo told him, hey, Jim, look, either you help me dispose of this situation or I'm going to get you and your family. And he made it seem like, like, look, I'm white, you black, like who they going to believe? So Jim, you know what I'm saying? They say help dispose of. So he, that's what his side of the story is. Do y'all know what the state did? The state was so locked in on Leo Frank being the murderer that they allowed Jim for them to convict Leo and sentence him to death. Like it was a rap. They ain't even, I don't even think he, I don't even think he got to tell his side of the story. It was a wrap. So, you know, when it comes to getting executed, it you, it don't happen the next day. At least back then and now it, it doesn't. So after two years of putting up appeals, it was 10 days before the execution, right? Then the governor stepped in. Y'all know how politics are. It was, a, it was like an election year. The government trying to do the right by right. He steps in. And he was like, all right, man, this man is supposed to die in 10 days. Let me be 110% sure that Leo Frank is the reason why Mary Fagan is not here. And that he deserves to be sentenced to death. So he goes back to the pencil factory. And he does a little bit more investigating of his own. And it comes to find out after doing some more probing, they go back to that whole poo smell. Y'all remember the whole poo smell earlier, right? I guess it was in some notes. They start asking some questions. Come to find out Jim, the janitor who claims that he was forced to help dispose of the body claims to have at times pooed <laughs> at the bottom of the elevator shaft. So the governor's just like, man, it's just too many coincidences with this guy, man. Maybe it really is this Jim. Maybe Jim was the sole pooer and murderer of, 
of little Mary Fagan. So now he's like, that's enough for me to mm, stay. Do I want to take a man's life? Ah, when I'm not sure who the mystery poor is or the murderer. So he was like, you know what? The people are going to love me for this. I am not going to execute this man, but I am going to just commute his sentence to life in prison. Oh, boy, people went back, back, beep, crazy out of their minds. They was like, what? You going to give Leo life? Man, hell no. Y'all, they ran that governor up out of Georgia. Y'all, they ran that governor up out of Georgia. Like him and his wife had to move up to New York. The people weren't playing. Y'all, so look, after he commuted Leo's sentence to life in prison, they start sneaking him around trying to get him in prison. So they finally get him in his jail, get him squared away. It got so bad. People were coming outside of the jail and just shooting at the jail, just hoping that they hit him. The prisoners got so tired of ducking and like becoming innocent bystanders of random drive-bys that they took it into their own hands. They grabbed Leo and they slit his throat. But Leo didn't die. He was, you know, got by the by the medical, the doctor, the doctor squared him away. It is what it is. But this is where the story takes another turn. That first attempt on Leo's life was definitely not his last. Y'all, do y'all know a whole clan of people, and I use the word clan because they do say it was the Ku Klux of clans, came to the prison. They said it was like seven cars, 25 people, everybody got guns, they go into the jail, walk past everybody that worked there, because they weren't fit to say none of them. <laughs> they got a job to do, y'all. <laughs> like, I, I come here to get my paycheck, man. I ain't come here to stop militias. <laughs> they walk in and grab Leo out his cell, drag him outside, take him to the woods, and they string him from a tree by his neck. Now, they have him standing on top of a table. They ask Leo, do you have any last words? And the last thing he said was, I'm innocent. They kicked the table from under Leo's feet and he sat there strangling for like 10 minutes until he passed away. They lynched Leo. But here's the wild part. They took pictures. No one was even ashamed of what they did. No one was worried about any repercussions. No one cared. They were all in the pictures. They made postcards out of the photos of Leo hanging from a tree. They left his body hanging from this tree so people could come from all around to witness and see what they had done. So after Leo passed away, his body was taken down and it was uh, given to his wife and she brought it back to I want to say Brooklyn, New York. So Leo is actually buried in Brooklyn, New York. If you ever want to make your way out there to visit his grave. But check this out. In 1982, on this man's deathbed, a gentleman by the name of Alonzo Mann, he made a wild confession. He said that he was a child working at the pencil factory back in the day. And that as he was walking through, he saw janitor Jim with the body of Mary Fagan in the basement. And he said that Jim looked at him and threatened to kill everybody in his life if he said anything. So Alonzo swore that he would not tell anybody. He told his mama. <laughs> he told his mama. And his mama was like, look, you don't ever talk about what you saw ever in life. She was like, you know, it was the clan that killed them people, man. Like, look, 
You don't want them to be getting you or anybody, your family. Like, just leave it alone. Don't say nothing. You didn't see anything. So that man held it with him until his dying deathbed. You see, you see, the thing about it was there really was no motive for Alonzo to lie. And a dying confession is taken pretty serious, they say. So people start looking into the case a little bit more. This is in the 80s. And they decided to give Leo Frank, after all of these years, a pardon. They pardoned Leo Frank well after his demise. So a lot of the family members, as you can see, are upset about that. They don't understand why they want something done about it. Tonight, Mary Fagan's namesake reveals to CBS 46 special assignment reporter Sally Sears how it affects her life to this very day. It won't go away. So Mary Fagan away, Keen so. has lived with her namesake's horrible death since she was 13. My science teacher in eighth grade, Mr. Henry, said to me, are you by chance related to that little girl that was murdered in Atlanta? And that is when the pain of being Mary Fagan's heir began. The boys in her class teasing her about being a murder victim reincarnated. She went straight back to her father. Is it true that there's another little Mary Fagan? And I swear to you, he stood back and turned whiter than whiter could be and said, who told you that? And he said, tomorrow when you go back to school, you tell Mr. Henry that yes, you are related and you are the namesake and great niece of little Mary Fagan. The infamous trial and later lynching of Leo Frank are captured in the neat files in her bedroom. Yet a century of doubt about Frank's guilt is here too. And in the Georgia archives where the Leo Frank story lives on. I found here photographs the New York Times staged but never published showing an alternate theory of the murder. The staging shows a model of Mary pushed down a hole into the basement, knocked unconscious, attacked and strangled by Leo Frank's so-called accomplice, Jim Conley, the star witness against Frank. My great-grandmother and great-stepfather were at the trial every day. Mary Fagan Keene recoils from these photographs. Convinced of Leo Frank's guilt, she is wondering if her own research into the case was worth publishing. I have the DNA in me. And when I have questions about it, I'll go to Mary's grave and ask if I am to get involved. And I always receive a sign that tells me yes. Her confidence leads her to protest the district attorney opening this case again. I think I would be very sad if they exonerated Leo Frank without the Fagan family involvement. But then I will push the world to know that we weren't involved in it. It is hard to imagine, after a century of fascination with this case, that the world will ignore her voice. I'm Sally Sears, CBS 46 News. Now another nugget, the archives hold a haunting message that Sally Sears will explore tonight at 11. But that's the wild story of Mary Fagan. You see, Mary Fagan is buried here at the Marietta City Cemetery. Let's go see if we can have a conversation. All right, Graveyard Shift family. Here we are at the final resting space of little Miss Mary Fagan. Check this out. It says Mary Fagan celebrated in song as little Mary Fagan after her murder at age 13 on April 26, 1913 in Atlanta the trial and conviction of Leo Frank were controversial, as was the commutation of his death sentence four days before the Confederate veterans marked her grave on June 25th, 1915. He was abducted from prison and lynched August 17th, 1915. In 1986, he was issued an, a pardon. Yeah, see how I see how I skipped over that word fast, ain't it? <laughs> Commutation. <laughs> is that how you say it? But no, that's wild, man. Here is the resting space of the family members. 
So here's in loving remembrance of George Fagan, 1884 to 1912. Then you have Mary Fagan right here. It says Mary Fagan erected by the Marietta camp number 763 UCV. But this has her being born June 1st, 1900. And this marker has her being born June 1st, 1899. But it says, Little Mary Fagan. Mary Fagan, daughter of Fanny and John Fagan, was born on June 1st, 1899 in Florence, Alabama. She was a beautiful little girl with a fair complexion, blue eyes, dimples, long reddish brown hair, and was jovial, happy, and thoughtful towards others. On April 26, 1913, Mary planned to go up to the National Pencil Company to pick up her pay of a dollar and 20 cents and then watch the Confederate Memorial Day Parade. Oh, uh, look at your boy knowing his facts when I spit them to you earlier. Mary did not return home that afternoon and was found, you know, and murdered in the basement of the National Pencil Company around 3 a.m. on April 27, 1913. Mary was 13 years old. Leo Frank, superintendent of the National Pencil Company, was arrested, tried, and convicted of the R word and murder of Mary Fagan. Leo Frank was lynched August 17, 1915 by the Knights of Mary Fagan. No Fagan was involved in the lynching. They make it a point to let you know that. No Fagan was involved in the lynching. But then in 1986, a pardon. Oh, it says the 1986 pardon does not exonerate Leo Frank from the murder of little Mary Fagan. So he was pardoned in 86, but they make it clear on this placard that does not exonerate Leo Frank. So to this day, there is so much speculation, so much finger pointing, like no one knows who who actually committed that horrendous crime. No one knows who committed that horrible crime. I said horrendous. <laughs> Y'all, I try to run it back. Clocked in for another amazing shift. Y'all, we've talked about it. We've discussed it. You've heard the story. There's a lot of players involved. And we are trying to get down to the bottom of what really happened to little Miss Mary Fagan. Remember, there's Leo Frank. There is Newt Lee, who was the night watchman. Remember, Leo Frank was the manager. Newt Lee was the night watchman. Jim Connolly. Well, I thought I heard somebody walk, which I probably did. Jim Connolly was the janitor. Everybody has suspicion to believe. Leo Frank was the person who was last to see her, allegedly and who was killed and hung and lynched for her murder. Newt Lee was the night watchman that supposedly found her. You know, we have Jim Connolly who end up, you know, his word end up being getting used against Leo Frank, but they always had their eye on Jim. So it's a tricky one. We'd we'll love to know your thoughts in the comment section. My name is Dalen. I come in peace, love and respect. Mary. We've all heard about your story. I know you know people know about it. You have placards talking about it. We would just really like even family members out there. So I don't want <laughs> this is like a, a disclaimer. <laughs> we don't know who we're talking to. It could be very well be anyone out there responding to us. We just hope and wish and like to believe that we can speak to Mary and hear her side of the story. So Mary, if you are here, you do have the opportunity to speak to us. Let's get to it. Is there anyone here that would like to speak to me? Oh, wow. 
won't cut on. Try to restart it. Were you messing with my spirit box? Now I heard Mary. Was that Mary or was that Rosemary? Can you tell me your name one more time, please? I would love to speak to Mary if she's here. So, about but I would I would love for you to say your name so I so, so I can move forward. Okay. Well, little Miss Mary, are you, are you here? Her there. Okay. So we all heard the story of what happened to you. I'm gonna ask the question, then I'm gonna cut the box on. We've all heard the story of what happened to you. Do you mind talking to us? Can we talk to you about what happened that day? Yeah. Can you? So can you? You'll start. So you don't mind telling us what happened? Uh -uh, I want to talk. This is so weird. It is weird. Okay. Artificial. Let me ask you this. Do you know the name of the person that harmed you? Wait a minute. Did that say Connolly? What are you? That's Hold on one second, Mary. Did the box did, did she say Connolly? Isn't that Jim's last name, the janitor? Who they thought did it all along? Y'all? Y'all? I don't have I don't have my notes. Let me let me look real quick. <laughs> let me look real quick just to make sure. <laughs> let me make sure. Y'all, I had to look. I had to look. That man's name is Jim Connolly. <laughs> Connolly. Connolly. Con and it sounded like she said Connolly. I don't know, y'all. Connolly. 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 Y'all. Okay. You ever just be like it? I. I was not expecting that. I got excited. I got so excited. I had to reconfirm the name just to make sure. Okay, Mary. Thank you. So why did people blame Leo? Well, Mary, was Leo involved in what happened? He heard what? 
Mary, let me ask you again. I'm, I apologize if I missed it. Did Leo harm you as well? So you don't know who? So you start hitting. They slapped you. But how do you know it was Jim Conley then? You said you heard him? We know Did you ever see Jim do it? You said what you saw? But did you did you did you see or did you just hear Jim? It is sad. So what did Leo do? He said hide it. So did Leo and Jim work together? Thank you. Y'all, that was straight to the point. <laughs> okay. Let me see if I heard that correctly. I need to go back and edit the video because I need to hear the responses. But from what I gathered, it sounded like she said that she knows it was Jim because she heard his voice. But they were hitting and slapping her. I think maybe I gathered that Leo assisted and he tried to hide it. I don't know. What did y'all get? What did y'all get from that conversation? Let me see. <laughs> Mary, do you feel like Leo got what he deserved? <laughs> Mary, do you want the truth to come out? Mary, how many people were involved with your that hurt you? Mary, before I leave, can I ask you one more time? Can you tell me the name of the person that harmed you? Well, it sounds like I heard Conley again, y'all. <laughs> right. Right. 
But Leo did help, right? We just want to update the people and let them know what really happened. Your family has been trying to get the word out, the truth out for a long time to keep the story right. My spirit lives. Your spirit does live. It lives on forever, Mary. Well, you're going to be remembered for a long time, Mary. There's a lot of people that care, and I know a lot of people are going to come visit you. So thank you so much. It's beautiful. Well, thank you, Mary. Sure, bye. Love, love, love. Y'all, I'm gonna be honest with you. I thought that conversation was gonna be a lot harder than that was. It seemed like little Mary was ready to talk. And she seemed like she was appreciative that she was given an opportunity to this speak. Is only available in the professional version. Seemed like she was very, very pleased to have an opportunity to speak. And maybe Jim wasn't lying. Maybe Jim did work with Leo. Maybe they both did do it. Because she could have adamantly said no when asked about Leo. She made it seem like he was he was a part of it too. But she specifically said twice, kindly. So maybe maybe Jim Connolly, the janitor who pooed in the elevator, maybe he's the mystery pooer and the murderer. Y'all, let me know in the comment section. Who do y'all think did it? We heard, well, I thought I heard what Miss Mary said. You tell me what you heard. Maybe you heard something totally different. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. Was it Lee? Was it New? Was it Jim? Who did it? Thank you, Mary. I appreciate you telling me your truth. I believe everything you said. And we're going to keep your name going. Little Mary Fagan. Love, love, love. Hey, wait a minute, y'all, before y'all leave. Look, if you love hanging out with your boy Daylin, check out my other two YouTube channels. My food review channel, Bites with Daylin, that's in the comment section. And my paranormal clip review channel, Ghost of the Roasted. Y'all, I'm dropping videos every week. Let's run them views up. Love, love, love. Catch you tomorrow.